Evening all. Um, happy Christmas, by the way, New Year when it comes again. Uh, let's have a look at a game I, I wanted to check out yesterday. I started checking it out. Uh, many of you will be familiar with it from Fisher's Memorable Games book. Now I wonder how many of you um, have actually started from the end of the book and worked uh, backwards, because the end of the book is the later game. So we're talking 1967 here. Now, it was entitled uh, When Champions Meet, which is interesting. In 1970, I, you know, I've got a book on Stein, and unfortunately for the chessboard, he died of a heart attack when he was just 38 years old. But his last recorded FIDE rating, according to Chess Games Com, was 2620. And in 1970, he won a tournament sharing with Karpov. That was in 1970. So, um, I don't know what it is. His name is like Bron Stein, but he's just Leonard Stein. So, just Stein's a popular uh, name, it seems. So, when champions meet Fisher playing white in the Seuss tournament, interzonal, I think, tournament 1967. So, we get the classic Roy Lopez. After a6, the bishop retreats. Now, knight f6. White castles. And black doesn't accept the pawn, which would be like open Roy Lopez, but just plays bishop e7. So it's going to be more quiet manoeuvring, one would expect. Rook e1, protecting that pawn now. b5, kicking the bishop to b3. d6, supporting e5. So maybe knight a5 is now on the cards, because e5 will not be on. So c3 looks like a logical move as well as being book for hundreds of years or whatever. So. Uh, castles and now black might also be threatening bishop g4 so h3 puts an end to that threat slightly weakens the king side of course but it's all book bishop b7 and now d4 so the classic occupation in the center two pawns side by side in the center and black classically now goes uh one would think for c5 that looks like a common move but actually actually Leonard Stein chooses knight c4. So this is provoking actually b3. So the advantage of this knight, it has unblocked the c pawn for later c5. And if b3 happens, so so what really? Knight b6 and and the knight's still not in the way of c5 later. So that's interesting, just to get a knight to c4 while it still can, before white plays b3. So interesting, knight c4. Probably all book. So b3, knight b6. So black's ready to strike out with c5 to put more pressure on d4 at some point. Or will he? Knight bd2. Actually, knight goes now to d7. Is this knight moving too many times? And Fisher actually discourages c5 a little bit with his next move. He plays b4. And... With this move, it's also potentially fixing b5, so a4 might be a wrenching move, and you can imagine white later like doubling behind a4 for ab, or just b5 being a bit vulnerable. So it's a bit of a concern, this b4 move, from a few different perspectives. Black now releases some of the central tension, actually. He plays ed, after c takes d4. An interesting uh, plan here which kind of prevents white from playing uh, for a4. He plays actually a5. Okay, Fisher takes, and now c5. So this pawn can be, it seems, obtained back uh, at leisure. But now, Fisher's central break looks a bit dangerous for black's king safety. Fisher plays e5. And look at this bishop striking against h7. And although this game is very, very complex and the variations, actually there's something quite sort of simple and attacking about it as well. That h7 is ganged up on for a little bit, uh, we're about to see. After d takes, d takes, the knight's dislodged from the defensive post of f6, which was protecting h7. Now we have knight e4, which is afforded because, of course, at the moment e5 is only attacked by one piece, defended by f3. The knight on e4 would look to be usefully sporting things like knight g5, bishop g5. So knight b4, attacking that valuable bishop on b on c2. It's put back simply on b1. This knight maybe can be evicted soon, one would think with a3, but if black's collecting this pawn, there's going to be a nasty pin 
on the a file. So a rook takes a5. It's a bit pointless perhaps in that respect to play a3 here. Fischer actually plays queen e2. So he's eyeing b5, maybe tying the rook down a bit to b5. Black doesn't want to lose that. Central move. <clears throat> knight b6. Black seems to have nice knights here. These impressive knights. Impressive bishop on the diagonal. But why it's leaning is towards the king side. Potentially these bishops are very impressive. And e6 is also <clears throat> I mean, not completely under lock and key as a potential threat here. Knight f g5 strikes at h7. So now there does seem to be an immediate threat of knight takes h7. Knight f6 double check and a queen coming in for a kill. So black here plays actually bishop takes e4 giving up his light square bishop. And now the first crude threat of the game, queen takes e4, threatening mate. And it's not just the knight sporting it, but the bishop over here. So bishop takes, queen takes his, his mate still. So in this position, a weakness is created around the black king position, g6. Now Fisher probes h7 again with a crude looking but very effective move, queen h4. h5. So we're reaching a crucial position. Look at these bishops. Just looking at the black king side, this pawn looking at e6. It looks as though this is really, G, uh, you know, dangerous. As if maybe even g4. Let's click outside to clear the arrows. That's a good trick. That does work. Thank you for that tip on YouTube, guys. So let's see. Why doesn't g4 work here? Is it just far too slow? Is there something like queen d4? I hesitate to turn on the evil engine, but let's just quickly check. G4, too crude, I guess. Queen D4, yes. Hitting A1. Let's offer the A1 rook. Is there time? Actually, black doesn't take on A1, takes on E5. If it takes on A1, curiously, actually, G takes H5. There might be some danger here for black. Okay. But actually just taking on e5 here is pinning the g pawn anyway. So g g takes is not a threat. So say bishop e3, queen uh, takes e5 or queen a1. Um, let's follow that through. Bishop takes g5 here. Queen takes g5. Knight d3. This is a bit pyrotechnic tactics to stop the onslaught. Hg. This looks a bit scary for black if black had to see all this uh, to defend her. But now the king is coming to question the white king. So I think this is just about okay. It's it's a small advantage to black actually. So maybe g4 was something to consider. Rather crude. But um, actually Fisher in this position didn't play g4. He played just queen g3. So he maintains more solid like threats without weakening his position of e6. Okay. Knight c4, very impressive knights on b4 and c4. A lot of queenside pressure. Knight f3. So it looks as though bishop takes g6 might be an immediate threat to really break up the king side. The king comes itself the defense of g6 with king g7. With the rook on f8, there's also an indication that if e6 actually that can be answered perhaps with f5. Supported by that rook on f8. So now we see queen f4 probing into those dark squares. Rook h8 defending against queen h6. And now finally e6. So is this going to be really troublesome for black? Black plays f5. And now Fisher does a, a seemingly logical move to try and wrench open black's king safety. I think the hackers among you would uh, spot this move. If I give you 10 seconds, can you spot what Fisher played here? 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, bishop takes f5. And it wasn't accepted. Let's see what kind of onslaught. It was replied to with queen f8. So what sort of onslaught was available to white if the pawn was taken? If we just uh, take care. Explore. 
apparently it's not 100% clear. Queen takes f5 is still queen f8. It's it's according to uh, Ecodini, this is about equal this position. Check. Queen d6. Maybe black has adequate defensive resources. Say check. On on brief analysis, it seems about equal. So anyway, queen f8 was played. So getting the queens off really, because uh, if queen g3 now, of course, queen takes f5. So the queens come off now after bishop e4, leaving black with seemingly dangerous queenside pressure not to be uh, sneered at. Black's got this rook or you know eyeing here. This rook could easily come one day if the bishop wasn't there, you know, to help support. But the, the, these knights are also pretty, pretty dangerous on the queen side, working well together. Isn't that pretty? Let's do another one, uh, almost. Uh, so anyway, they're working well together. Let's get rid of the arrows there. Okay, so queen takes f4, bishop takes f4. So a2's on, perhaps, one would think, but maybe too dangerous to take. In fact, the move rook e8 was played. So we've actually got a very aesthetic position. If you look at this, two knights here and two bishops here. Impressive, and it's as if these bishops are busy on the king side, and these knights are busy on the queen side. It's funny. I just find this position very funny. I don't know what you guys think. Just aesthetically, to have reached this position is sort of incredible. Um, to what goes on though, if Black did try and win the a2 pawn, let's have a quick check. So instead of rook e8, is there a, some sort of disaster? Where rook takes a2. White's apparently better, but say rook a2. Not a complete disaster, apparently. Just rook a d1, rook a7. Seems reasonable. Seems a small advantage for white still is given. Okay, so no drastic punishment for that sort of move. Rook takes a2. But um, maybe the, you know, Stein realized the pawn wasn't going anywhere that quick with these knights gripping the queen side. So he just plays rook e8. Now we have rook a d1, so a2 is really offered because white really wants to get a rook to d7. Maybe bishop g5 and nasty frets against the pin bishop. Rook a6 is basically saying, well, you do rook d7, I'll take the pawn. And that's what happened actually, rook d7 with a seemingly dangerous pin. And maybe, you know, this is a critical moment where the advantage actually went up. I'm not 100% sure this this is such a great move rook a6 going into this nasty pin on the seventh rank. Um, let's have a look rook a6 rook d7 the advantage did creep up for white significantly according to Houdini here after this this continuation. So rook takes e6 another nasty move tactical forcing moves now. Knight g5 after rook f6 Threatening, it seems, the bishop on f4. Fisher counterattacks this bishop on e7 with his next move. He plays bishop f3. This a rook on e7. Once e7 is captured, will coordinate with a knight on g5, almost with a mating net. But there's another cunning thing. It's not to do with a, a simple exchange of bishop for bishop. Unfortunately, after rook takes f4. White can actually just win the exchange with this simple knight check. King f6, so he just takes, he's the exchange up. But, you know, is black's position without hope here? Potentially black's got two connected past pawns. If he can just grab this pawn, these knights could, could sort of herd these pawns in theory. So Fisher's got to play quite accurately. Knight e5 also threatens immediately to really smash white's pawn structure as well. Forking here. So rook b7. Okay, now knight takes f3 wasn't played. Uh, it would leave black unfortunately with a pin on the e file against the rook on e8. In fact, bishop d6 was played. Now unveiling a threat actually on the e1 rook because knight takes f3 will be followed by rook takes e1. So the king comes to support. Uh, the e1 rook and avoid that knight takes f3 being a check. Knight c2 attacking the rook. So we have seemingly tactical chaos. 
White has to play very precisely. I think Fisher finds a very precise technical move here. Um, I don't think other moves, I have a suspicion other moves are going to be bad for him if he's not careful in this position. He played Rook E4, which I think retains the advantage. Now let's just see another move. Well, apparently he's okay actually. Knight D5 apparently is theoretically stronger with the idea of Rook B6 after. But let's say Rook D1, that's also apparently okay. Okay, so Rook E4 is, is a good move as well. So here's the exchange up after all, but what about these two connected past pawns here? Knight d4, are the knights going to be able to herd them? Is this structural damage about to occur? Rook b6, immediately uh, attacking the bishop has to be defended. And now check, which is leading to a centralization of knight on e3 now, check. And now b5 is really a target after bishop e2. So Fisher of the exchange up is avoided structural damage and is now this bishop is threatening to get a pawn. And if the pawn moves forward there might be either bishop c4 or knight c4. Possibly bishop c4 actually because knight c4 there might be knight takes e2. But uh, Stein in this position actually he doesn't dare move the pawn forward. Let's just quickly check moving the pawn forward just, just, just to see could the pawn have just been moved forward. Actually, apparently here, stronger than bishop c4 is f4, kicking in the knight first. Now, if the knight dares to move here, I think this is going to be horrible. It's going to be splat for black. Well, actually, it's pinned to the king, so that's an illegal move. <laughs> so that's why that move is pretty strong. Say knight f5 threatens knight g3 check, king f2, and this is a crushing position. So b4 is basically unplayable. Uh, so basically what's happened after bishop e2 is a threat has been unveiled which I didn't realize. Not just attacking b5 but the threat is now f4 to deal with. So that's perhaps why Stein moves his king off to avoid f4 being a total disaster. But he is losing the b5 pawn. So now we have a situation four pawns for white, three pawns for black. Still the exchange down. Black still has these good knights though, but he's about to lose one of them with knight takes b5. One pass pawn, it's starting to get a bit more miserable. a4, not moving the rook, just keeping it there. Keeping c4 under lock and key because rook takes e5, or any rook takes e5. King, uh, sorry, bishop c7, and now king e2. So it's starting to guard, the king itself is starting to guard key squares, keeping on the light square away from blacks dark square bishop. So I think uh, black's in a critical state here. He's lost the pride of his position, those those two connected uh, pawns unfortunately. And the two knights were very impressive before but now back to down to one knight. So g5 and now actually Fisher plays g3 which supports the idea of kicking that central knight with f4. Rook a8 threatening perhaps rook a4 and king b5 at some point. So the rook on b5 is a little bit of a tactical vulnerability. It goes to b2 to avoid any stuff like that perhaps. So still with f4 on the cards, white's the exchange up. So after rook f8, now f4 is played. Uh, despite the potential maybe for that pawn becoming slightly loose, uh, one would imagine, because of knight g6. But actually after g takes g takes, knight g6 wasn't played. Possibly because of rook e6 check, winning the knight. That would be a terrible blunder as well, unfortunately. So black cannot gang up on the f4 pawn like that. Not too many squares for the knight. In fact, knight d7 doesn't look too palatable either because of rook e6 check. And if bishop d6, then there's knight c4, and it looks pretty nasty. So actually the knight went back to f7. And then we have check after knight d6, f5, this f pawn looks as though it's getting a bit dangerous. Rook a8, and it seems as though the a pawn can be sacrificed for positional advantage. After rook d2, putting the pressure on, a4 is given up as a positional pawn sack, f6, and the f pawn looks to be winning the position quite clearly now. Black has no hope, it seems, to defend against the f pawn. Let's explore this. Let's say Let's go on a bit here. Um, so say king d7, check, 
f7 just just absolutely winning here now in that position also king d8 what was the problem knight f5 everything's coordinating it seems on poor king is always in the way in this game okay so uh that was it after f6 let's delete the remaining moves there let's go back in overview and summary so it was a, a royal of has with a very aesthetic type of contrasting set of pieces with the knights on the queen side the bishops looking down on the king side at one stage um, Stein was definitely uh, you know a Russian champion and we should have a look at some of his games I think as well as some more bronze themed games so the two Steins they both share a very dynamic creative attacking style and um, I think Gasparov is quoted as saying of um, Stein that he helped uh, you know evaluate the parameters of, of sacrificing material for quality on the chessboard um, okay so a lot of his games are attacking but on this on this occasion he was on the receiving end it seemed a very technically precise play his king it's just seemed to be getting in trouble in various scenarios the first scenario lost the exchange actually so the king's in real trouble with king f8 here by the way there's knight h7 check winning the exchange as well so it was a very difficult position for black to defend not to go the exchange down and nasty pin on the e file if not f3 so that wasn't too tempting and now it seems you know again the the king's an excuse to centralize the knight now and after this bishop e2 again the king's you know getting in the way tactically of things with f4 being a major threat now so again the king tries to get out of the way but clearly the exchange down starting to be a bit desperate now the position now this g3 is making way for the winning pass pawn the f pawn even about to be a pawn can be, the a pawn can be used as a positional sacrifice pretty soon just to gain time for this f pawn to queen i hope you enjoyed that game but we should really look at uh, some excellent stein wins he's beaten tau 3-1 with about 15 draws or something we, maybe we can look at some of those games soon Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.